y'all sit at the back. I'm serious. Really? Really? Oh, my stars and little Sputniks. Okay. Um, remind everyone, the session is meeting tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. If you have any questions or comments you need to make to the elders, please do so. Um, nominating committee will meet Sunday, August 27th, next Sunday after the worship service. Any other announcements in the life of our church from anybody? Can y'all hear the choir by, all the way back here in the, in the Grand Canyon? Okay. All right. All right. Let us move deeper into worship by reading responsibly from the Psalter as printed in your bulletin. Please read the bold. Praise the Lord. Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise God for his mighty deeds. And the same to the praise of our God, hymn number 87, Fairest Lord Jesus. Yes.
given to the board our thoughts concerning the disappointment we have in ourselves, what we've done, what we've not done. Let us confess our sins in silent prayer to the Lord. Let us pray. Christian friends, hear these words from the scriptures. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the expiation for our sins. Let's say together, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Because we have experienced the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, let us pass his peace to one another. Welcome each other to the service today. Please stand and do that. I didn't know the choir was here. <laughs> I forgot that. I'm sorry, I have to do it. Please forgive me. I just walked right over that. No wonder they didn't pick up on it. <laughs> I apologize. I'm sorry. I don't know why. I, I've never done that before in my entire 41 years of ministry. I've never skipped the choir, for goodness sake. Well, thank you all for your graciousness. Let me confess my sins of the Almighty God. <laughs> I have to tell you, he's getting back at me because I forgot to get a book for him to sing. So he's making it even. Let me say one word about the song we're doing today. It's a medley of songs. And one of the things about music that I love is the ones we love have an ancient tradition. The first part of this medley is called Jerusalem, My Happy Home. The words for it were written a thousand years ago by a monk called Bernard of Cluny, he was in a Cluny a monastery. The melody emerged in Virginia in a Sacred Heart book in 1844. Uh, singing Billy Walker brought out this collection. And so you've got words from a thousand years ago, a melody that came out in Virginia in, the, in uh, the last part of the century. So we're doing a medley of Sacred Heart tunes.
bride, will you please pass a piece of rice to one another? <laughs> from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 11, beginning at the 28th verse. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who are heavy laden, tired, carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and put it upon you. And learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in spirit, and you will find rest. For the yoke I will give you is easy, and the load I will put on you is light. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, look with favor and mercy upon this, your community of faith in this holy place. I thank you for their witness to you, their living 
for you for so many years. Be with all of us now. Touch us with your Holy Spirit so that we would hear your voice speaking to us through these ancient words. And hear that not just in our minds, but in the depths of our heart. And help me, O oh Heavenly Father. Help me, Lord Jesus. Help me, Holy Spirit, to preach rightly and truthfully unto your people gathered here this day. In the name of Christ, amen. Well, we finally come to the end of where I on the subject of David and his rise to the kingship. The interesting thing is that David is not in this story per se. We're going to go back and focus on Saul and uh, how Saul met his end, which is rather amazing. So I hope that you all have enjoyed. Yeah, really. I mean, you know, come to church to have fun. Come to worship God. Yeah. That, mm. that was Mr. Spencer in my home church. Yes, it was. <laughs> Not my dad. Anyway, my point is, I hope you've enjoyed coming and listening to me. I thank you for that. I've got one more Sunday with you. And I'm going to focus on next week my closing sermon for this art. It will be a parable. From Matthew, that's all I'm going to say at this point. Very familiar. No, it's from Matthew, not Luke. Luke is where you have the prodigal son and uh, the good Samaritan. This is from Matthew. So, take your pick. There's a bunch of them. Anyway, to the matter at hand, the closing sermon is an exposition of 1 Samuel chapter 28. And it's interesting how Samuel's put together because if you're familiar with the number of novels, with novels, if you're familiar with novels that have uh, several character arcs going on at the same time, it's not unusual for the author to write a chapter about this character and what's happening to them. Then the next chapter is another character, what's happening to them, and the next chapter, what's happening with them, and then finally, you know, we. The author weaves them and she brings it together, kind of sort of in. That's what's happening here. And please remember that the chapters and verses did not come about until, oh gosh, late in the Middle Ages, the chapters. Uh, <clears throat> it's interesting to me that a friend of mine gave me a, a gift of a Luther Bible, uh, first edition of a Luther Bible, you know, copy of it. And I was reminded in flipping through it and reading what I could from it. Uh, there are no verses in it. It's just chapters. And the original scrolls, original copies, had no chapters. So it's not really confusing to the author what he's doing, nor would it be to the hearers either. But in chapter 28, the first several verses are the tag end of what I preached on last week about David and the possibility of David being brought by King Achish, whom he was serving, Achish being king, to fight against his own country, his own countrymen in battle. That's where I ended it. And now I want to go back and pick up where actually I left off. Verse 3. Now Samuel had died. All the Israelites had mourned for him and buried him in honor in his hometown of Ramah. Saul had forced all the fortune tellers <clears throat> and mediums to leave Israel. Note that. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Philistine troops assembled and camped near the town of Shunem. Saul gathered the Israelites and camped at Mount Gilboa. When Saul saw the Philistine army, he was terrified. So he asked the Lord what to do. The Lord did not answer him at all, either by dreams or by the use of Urim and Thummim or by prophets. And I'm sure a number of you said, what's Urim and Thummim? <laughs> we don't know exactly, but 
The closest we can come to it is a pair of dice. Not kidding. Uh, the priests in old Israel would have some sort of sticks or something that they would then cast and read and say, Ah, the Lord says, won't. Yeah. The Lord did not speak through that, nor through dreams. We're all familiar with the story of Joseph and interpreting dreams. And there's a couple of others in the Old Testament. Not, or by prophets. You know, we tend to think, you say prophets, because we've been trained in Sunday school and stuff to think, oh, I can name the prophets. I know some of them. Uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, 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 oh yeah, Amos, and I don't know the rest of them. Sit down, Mr. Young. Okay. <laughs> Don't know there were bands of prophets like 30, 40, 50 together, roamed around. And they would get going. <laughs> yeah, they would. The prophets were normally linked to the king. They weren't staff, but they were only a step or two away from the king's staff. And so when the king wanted to know he's going to win the battle or whatever, he would consult the prophets and they would do their thing and tell the word of the Lord as they perceived it. But God is very quiet here. And this scares Saul nearly out of his mind. What's he afraid of? We know. We know. He doesn't want to lose his kingship. He wants to continue being king. Now, in his mind, he knows David's going to be king, but as long as I'm alive, I'm going to be king. I'm going to quit worrying so much about David. That was a promise when they met, remember, in the cave. But he's terrified of losing that kingship before he wants to give it up, and he never wants to give it up. He's also terrified of dying. Remember in those days, it was the king who took point in the battle. That's right. He's the one who led the charge, so to speak, in his chariot. Saul's terrified to do that. Mm. And Saul hasn't acted like a king in a very, very long time. Notice that all of his decisions that we've heard of have revolved around himself. It revolves around his desires, and those desires are rooted in fear. He's terrified of what might happen to him. He looks out on the Philistine army. I will let say this, but I think it's, <laughs> it's a good chance that they had more men on the field than he did, and he knew it. I'd be frightened about that too. But notice that Saul's fear is such that it controls everything about him. Everything. His perceptions. His decisions. Now, next thing at verse 2, excuse me, verse 7, then Saul ordered his officials, find me a woman who is a medium, and I will go and consult her. There's one in Endor, they answered. I'm using the Good News Bible, and that's the, the Bible I read for my own enjoyment, my own prayer times. Uh, and that translates the Hebrew word to what we have here. The traditional King James Version is witch. And this, thou shalt not suffer witch to live back in Leviticus. Thou shalt not suffer a medium to live. What's going on with that? Mediums just tell the future, and, you know, flip a coin, <laughs> whether they're right or wrong. The problem 
is that in old Israel, only God knows what's going to happen. God is in charge of the future. We are in God's hands. Our job is to do our best to live for God and give our future into his hands. But to try and see what's going on so that would govern our actions? No, that's usurping God's position. They would call it blasphemy. But Saul goes against his own rule and looks for me. He's desperate to hear something from God. And listen to what he does. So Saul disguised himself, put on different clothes. After dark, he went with two of his men to see the woman. Consult the spirits for me and tell me what's going to happen, he said to her. Call up the spirit of the man I name. The woman answered, Surely you know what King Saul has done, how he forced the fortune tellers and the mediums to leave Israel. Another way to translate, he has killed all the fortune tellers and mediums. Why then are you trying to trap me and get me killed? And Saul made a sacred vow. By the living Lord, I promise that you will not be punished for doing this, he said. Whom shall I call up for you, the woman asked. Samuel. Excuse me? When Saul did not do what God had commanded, and this was the straw that broke the camel's back, Samuel had nothing to do with Saul. He anointed David, he left. Samuel has had nothing good to say about Saul. Why in the world would Saul want to call up Samuel? Oh my stars. Because Samuel's the one that Saul knew was so connected to God. And here's a more subtle reason that I really think he asked for Samuel. Samuel always told the truth. He never led Saul on. Not like some prophets, not like half the people in the court. No. He let it. Samuel just said it straight. And Saul is obviously desperate to hear a word from the Lord. The Lord who anointed him king. A word from the Lord that will get him out of the pickle that he's in. He's surrounded by him. He can't get out. He has to lead an attack. No matter if they're going to win or lose, he has to do that. And he's terrified to do that. Verse 8. Excuse me, verse 12. When the woman saw Samuel, <clears throat> she screamed and said to Saul, Why have you tricked me? You're King Saul. Don't be afraid, the king said to her. What do you see? I see a spirit coming up from the earth. She answered. What does it look like? It's an old man coming up. He's wearing a cloak. And Saul knew that it was Samuel bowed to the ground in respect. Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me? Why did you make me come back? Saul answered, I am in great trouble. Great trouble. The Philistines are at war with me. God has abandoned me. He doesn't answer me anymore, either by prophets or by dreams. So I have called you for you to tell me what I must do. Samuel said, Why do you call me when the Lord has abandoned you and become your enemy? The Lord has done to you what he told you through me. He's taken the kingdom away from you, given it to David. You disobeyed the Lord's command and did not completely destroy the Amalekites and all they had. That's why the Lord is doing this to you now. He will give you and Israel over the Philistines. Tomorrow, you and your sons will join me, and the Lord will give the army 
of Israel over to the Philistines. Is God going to relent? No. Most commentators talk about Samuel being cantankerous. One commentator I checked even wrote that Samuel could have at least had some kind word to this poor man in such great distress. There's a point to that, but that's not what the scriptural text is about. That's our own modern sensibilities coming to play. The scripture is interested in letting us know Samuel speaks truth, truth that hasn't changed to Saul. And Saul has heard this before, first from Samuel, and then I'm sure on his own mind and from other people. And he has run away from this truth whole kingship just about. God has rejected him as king, has chosen David. He's run away from that even though he says it, he doesn't act on it. And that's what we do, isn't it? When we don't like what we're hearing. I'm most familiar with that in my own family with alcoholism. Alcoholics on both my mother's side and my dad's side. Thanks be to God, my father nor my mother were, but they sure had brothers and sisters who were, and it was one melt of a hiss in their families. It's only gotten worse when my cousins, when we grew up, shared some things that happened. Awful. One thing I know is uh, somebody who is an alcoholic knows the truth about themselves. You know what they do. They remember for the most part. Does that stop them from drinking? No. Until they get to the point where they cannot dodge that truth anymore for whatever reason. But that's just alcoholism. All addictive behavior has that hook. And there's something in us, whether we're a drug addict, whether we're addicted to that other person, even though we're married. We can't give it up, even though we know what's going to happen. And it's not that we ignore it. But we look around and try to justify it. It's not my fault. It's what she did. It's what he did. It's not my fault. It's the way Dad raised me. Not my fault, it's the way mom raised me. It's not my fault, it's what was going on in the world and life, and I had to do these things to succeed. Really? Yeah. Not want to think about that. My point is simply this. There's a great truth of life here. That we can dodge and we duck for a long time sometimes, but there comes a day there comes a day when that doesn't work anymore. And we have to face the truth. And the deep fear in us is facing that truth will completely destroy me. I will cease to exist. And we know that's not true up here, but in our depths. Why do you think we're running away from it? People will think ill of me. I can't deal with that. My own kids turn away from me. I can't deal with that. I won't have a job. I can't deal with that. At once, Saul fell down, lay stretched out on the ground, terrified by what Samuel said. He was weak because he had not eaten anything all day long or that night. The truth knocks him down. Finally. Finally. It penetrates. And 
look at this surprising mercy that comes Saul's way. The medium went over to him and saw that he was terrified. So she said to him, please, sir, I risked my life by doing what you asked. Now, please do what I ask. Let me fix you some food. You must eat so that you will be strong enough to travel. Saul refused, said he wouldn't eat anything, but the two officers with him urged him to eat. So he finally gave in, got up from the ground, sat on the bed. The woman quickly killed the calf, which she had been fattening. Then she took some flour, prepared it, baked some bread without yeast. She set the food before Saul and his officers. They ate it, and they left that same night. Now, that took several hours, of course. And in that time, Saul processed things. That little bit of mercy by the woman gave him some, some needed time. She's merciful to him when he would have ordinarily shown her no mercy. She sees Saul as the king, a royal personage. He shouldn't be groveling on the ground like this, nor should he faint from hunger. He has a battle to fight. She knows that. In fact, the medium sees Saul as God saw Saul from the beginning and acts to bring him to himself, so to speak. Shadows of God's love in a strange place. And it happens more than we, we could think. The amazing thing is, this penetrated. The truth that Saul had been running away from for so long, losing the throne, the kingdom, and die, having to bear the consequences of his decision and his behavior, which he knew had been so bad. He'd avoided for years. Now all of his decisions has brought him to this place, has brought the army he was leading to this place where they are probably going to be defeated. It's his fault. He cannot run away. And the truth hits him like a freight train, knocks him down. But instead of getting up and fleeing, for the first time in years, Saul starts to act like a king. I'm kidding. You skip over to chapter 31. The Philistines fought a battle against the Israelites on Mount Gilboa. Many Israelites were killed there. The rest of them, including King Saul and his sons, fled. The Philistines caught up with them and killed three of Saul's sons, Jonathan, Benadad, and Mount Shua. The fighting was heavy around Saul. He himself was hit by a number of enemy arrows. He was badly wounded. He said to the young man carrying his weapons, Draw your sword and kill me, so that these godless Philistines won't gloat over me and kill me. But the young man was too terrified to do it, so Saul took his own sword and threw himself on it. The young man saw Saul was dead, so he too threw himself on his own sword and died for Saul. And that is how Saul, his three sons, and the young man, all of Saul's men, died that day. And the Israelites on the other side of Jezreel Valley and east of the Jordan River heard that the Israelite army had fled. Saul and his sons had been killed. They abandoned their towns and fled. Then the Philistines came and occupied the towns. The Saul. Now, please remember something. This is an Oriental culture. It's not what we would call Western. That is the Western civilization. No. This is a culture that disciplines itself by shaming. Shaming. If Saul allowed himself to be captured, it would have been a terrible disgrace. If he stayed alive somehow, fled the battle, 
save his own skin, stretch out a few more miserable weeks of life. No, that would be a disgrace for himself and above all for the kingship, for Israel and even for God. So he did what he did. Please understand his actions from within are based on his culture and judging from that, what I want you to see is that Saul, for the first time in so many years, Saul acts like a king. It gets up. He puts on his armor. He stands tall. He gets into his chariot. He takes point. And yes, the fighting is thick around him. Of course it was. But he fought like a man. He took the arrows. Yeah. And he still survived the battle. He's tough. He sure as heck hadn't been tough. What happened? When we let the truth come into us, the truth we've been dodging for so long, all of a sudden, all that fear, we've been so scared, poof, it goes away. Does it change things? No. But we become able to handle it, to deal with it in an effective way, I would say. Saul finally found himself. And his end, though tragic, to me, Saul is worthy of Shakespeare. This is a tragic ending. He met it as the king he was. Why couldn't he have done it so many years ago? Do we leave it there? No, I can't. I'm a Christian pastor. So I connect the New Testament to this, and I am deeply aware that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And that, what he's talking about there, understand that this is a sequence. It's not, I'm the way, truth, and life. Boom, boom. No, 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 no. I am the way. My way of living leads to the truth in your life. It leads to you seeing who you really are. And God sights, oh my star. And how God sees us through his son. And that truth coming into us, all fear goes away. And we are led by that truth into real life. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life. Real, outstanding life. Yeah. Christ's truth is not our destruction. We sometimes think that truth we've been dodging is. This is why sometimes God comes to us as the enemy. Please understand that everything God does to us is from a loving hand. It may not seem like that, but it is a loving hand. And the only way I can say that to you publicly is that I know I understand the Father through the Son. And that's why Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am low and meek at heart. For my burden my yoke, that is to say, the burden I put upon your shoulders, which is true, 
truth about ourselves, the truth about the world, the truth of life itself. I am putting that on your shoulder, so it, other people might think it's a terrible, terrible burden, but it's not. It's life. And you can handle it because I give you life. I give you real life. I give you peace. I give you strength. So if you're running away from something that you don't want to face, stop you running, please. Remember, Jesus is with you. And he will help you face what you need to face. He will help you shoulder what you need to shoulder. He will lead you into truth that will lead you to life. That is his promise. Take him at his word. Let us pray. Oh Lord, Jesus, our blessed Savior, stop us from running away from you. Stop us from running away from all that we don't want to face. Hear our fears that we pray unto you so much. Have mercy upon us. Help us to know to the depths that you have forgiven us, Lord Jesus, and that by your presence in our lives and the depths of our hearts, our consciousness, your presence, your Holy Spirit, you will turn us around. You will help us to accept the consequences of our actions. And you will set our feet upon the path that leads to life. Thank you for loving us so much. In the name of Christ our Savior we pray. Amen. Let us receive our morning offering. Father, thank you for loving us so much that you give us all that we have, our life, our bodies, our family, our friends, even the air we breathe. 
Thank you for your blessings, your gifts. Now we, we out of the abundance you have given us and the deep gratitude we have to you, we give these gifts back to you. Please, Lord, help us to use them for your will in this place. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Christian friends, let us say what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed as found on the inside of your emblem. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our final hymn is number 423, Bond of Love. Turn no one evil for evil, but rather strengthen the faint-hearted. Love, support the weak. And whatever you do, do everything in the name and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be all glory, honor, and praise, now and forever. Amen. Amen.